How's it going, everybody? Welcome back into another episode of the Celtics Talk Weekly Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Justin Lowen. Justin, this is a first for us. This is a first. This is a first. Of this hopefully is, many. Of, of many, right. I like this better. I think this is right. better than sitting in a, in a Zoom call right. from hundreds of miles away. But guys, again, before I get started, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Um, again, we're, we're trying some stuff new, uh, some new stuff here. Um, as we're going to be progressing out throughout the season. Hopefully the content is a little bit nicer, a little bit crisper. There should be, I think, a more enjoyable um, listen and watch if you're watching us on YouTube because, again, uh, you know, in person it's just a little bit better. But we got a lot to talk about today, Justin, because the Celtics, you know, it's, it's been an interesting season for these guys because they've been so great, yet it feels like for some reason people aren't sold on them yet, right? especially in the Boston media. Um, so we're going to dive into that. We're going to dive into the Marcus Smart. We were both there. Yeah. That was awesome. It was. That Very was awesome. Very good. I think the reception was really good. Right. We'll get into all that, but uh, packed house as well. So, right. Uh, you know, yeah, for sure. Definitely. And I know some all-star snubs. We're going to be talking about that. And news just broke before we started this. Uh, it was great. It was a little right into this uh, the little script we got going. Some trade deadline targets, and then alongside, you know, the Celtics in January. We're going to be getting into that. Um, so, again, should be an excited episode. Let's jump right into it, uh, Justin. The Marcus Smart game. We were both in attendance. We were talking before the show started. We were saying how we kind of wished it was like it was a bummer because no John Morant, no Jalen Brown, no Jaron Jackson, no Desmond Bain. So, aside from the game, though, we'll talk about the game, but the reception. What did you think of it? I thought the reception was everything and more. I thought when Marcus Smart came out of the locker room the first time during warm-ups, usually yeah. injured players don't enter the bench until, you know, halfway through the first quarter. Right. Smart came out. The reception was amazing. A standing ovation right away. It's like the player, it's like the fans were specifically looking at the tunnel just waiting for Marcus Smart to exit. Uh, instant, we love Marcus Chance. Instant, thank you, Marcus Chance. Smart, acknowledged the crowd. I think Smart was very emotional and yeah. he stressed how he knew that he was going to get the love, but he wanted to be surprised at the same time. Right. Uh, but to be honest with you, I don't think he was surprised as well as it, it went right. because I think he knows how much uh, Celtics Nation meant to him and how much he meant to us. So I think um, everything went great. Um, I, I really wish he was healthy. I don't wish injury upon anybody. Uh, especially a guy like Marcus Smart. Uh, I really wish he was healthy and he started because, I mean, I feel like it, the place really would have exploded if they mentioned, you know, if they Eddie Palladino was calling his number. Right, You yeah. know, from Oklahoma State. No doubt. You know, so. Right, and, and I thought that it was as good as it could have gone for, again, for him not playing because I, th I think that does take a factor away, and I think there was going to be a competitive edge to it that I was excited to kind of see Smart going up against Brown and Tatum. Um, I was excited to see that, but again, uh, as a whole, I think that game meant a little bit more to the, uh, the the Celtics fans from anywhere from like 15 to 24. I think that game held a little bit more meaning to us because that's Mark. That's I me. Mean, that's who Smart was. Smart was like our Paul Pierce kind of. Correct. Right? Correct. Wasn't winning as much correct. as Pierce, but the meaning um, in which you know he played with and everything. It, it was it was big, but the game itself was a blowout. And I mean, we could talk about it, but I mean, at the same time, it's like it was a game you had to you had to do that. I thought. It was a game where you come off of a horrendous Lakers loss and you needed to blow out that team. Whether Ja, Marcus, Jaron, Jack, whether they were playing or not, you needed to go out there and have a game like they did. Right. thought it was a little bit frustrating in the first half uh, where it was just back and forth and the Celtics quickly went out to a nine-point lead uh, in the first quarter and then that dwindled down and all of a sudden it's 44-40 to 40 and you know Tatum – was doing Jason Tatum things at the end of the half to really push that lead out to 20. I mean, I think it was like a 23 to four run. Right. Um, and then the second half just, you know, it's, it, you know what type of game it was. It was the G leaguers went in with about nine minutes left <laughs> in the game. Yeah. It played nearly an entire quarter, but again, that was the type of game the Celtics needed to have because I don't know where you're going with this, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to go back to that Lakers game really quick and say, 
that was one of the worst games I think I've seen the Celtics play in quite a while. And right. if you didn't watch the game and you're just one of those who either checks out the highlights or you know checks out the box score, Celtics only lost that game by nine. Yeah. Celtics G-Leaguers made it pretty in the end. Right. I'll tell you right now, nine first quarter turnovers to the Los Angeles Lakers without uh, Anthony Davis and LeBron James. The Lakers are statistically one of the, if not the worst, first quarter team in the league matching up against the Celtics who are the best. They had nine turnovers, Boston did. That is not a recipe for no. success. And then you let Austin Reeves start in threes, and D'Angelo Russell is showing why he should be staying in L.A. And then you let, uh, who was it? He just he just got injured. Was it Vanderbilt? Was it McDaniels? I forget who it was. He just he hit 25% three-point shooter, and he's knocking down threes. So oh, Hachimura? That, no, it was, no, uh, he Hachimura. went down with a foot injury uh, in, the, yeah. in the quarter. But oh. either way, the Celtics got embarrassed on their home court on national television against the Los Angeles Lakers. You had to think they had to come out and beat the Memphis Grizzlies by 40 points. It didn't matter who was playing. Celtics needed that win. Yeah, I thought that the Lakers game was embarrassing. No doubt. I mean, I right. was there. I was in house. And uh, the turnovers, was it was just ugly. And I think it was – there's been a couple games this year, but the Lakers game in particular because it was at home, It they just – the energy was they, – they did not want to play that game. And – it that one against LA on national TV, which I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about national TV later in the podcast because that's that's been a real problem for some reason. Uh, Justin makes a joke with me. It's like keep us off national television. <laughs> it's not a joke, it's, Rob. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah, because it it really is. It's just been terrible. But something I did draw from the Memphis Grizzlies game that hopefully the coaching staff also picked up on, which I assume they did. The Porzingis and Jason Tatum action, Justin. Hasn't been something that they've tapped into really much this year. It's been a lot of uh, Jalen Brown and, and, and Porzingis, which, man, again, I love that, right? Cookies and cream, I'm loving that this year. However, I think there's a a, a whole other level that, that that duo can kind of unlock with Tatum and Porzingis because they were, again, Memphis, it's tough to, to ha- how much stock do I put into a Memphis Grizzlies game on our performance? But Porz- Porzingis and Tatum, man, that pick and roll, when you got two guys over 6'10", who can both stretch the floor and both beat you off the dribble to the rim, that's a tough guard. It is a very tough guard, and it's it's two all-star caliber players, all NBA caliber players going at it. And here's the thing. I hate when Boston goes away from those two players specifically because not only are those two of your best players on the team, but Jason Tatum will get going. I'll, I'll you know go right to Porzingis. I'll tell you an example. First quarter against the Denver Nuggets just about a week or two ago. Chris F. Porzingis, 14 points. He finished with 21. I know Seamus mentioned this to Gary Tangway in the last podcast episode. Celtics went away from that. Jason Tatum, they went away from Jason Tatum in games. I thought if there was a bright side to the Clippers game when we lost by 30 to the Clippers the other night, it was that Jason Tatum was the only one that got going, and the ball never found Jason Tatum, especially in the second half, right? So the Celtics, I don't know why they go away, and I get it. They have so many weapons. They have so many weapons. But when Chris Stapps, Porzingis, and Jason Tatum specifically are in that two-man game and it's working so successful, wouldn't you think that just if it ain't broke, don't fix it? Keep it going. Keep it rolling. And to me, that's one of the Celtics' weaknesses. They find something and they don't consistently do it. Right, and it's not a knock on them. I don't, you know, I'm not going to sit there and, and coach them and, and and you know think I'm better than Missoula. But when you're the fan watching and you're studying the game, right. you kind of sit there and question yourself: if it's working, why are they going away from and, it? And, and I don't think that is necessarily like because I look at that and I, I agree. I tend to agree. I think that the Celtics have this luxury of essentially every game they play, the other team is has an exploit the Celtics can use. I mean, whether it's their guard size with Holiday and White, whether it's their lack of interior defense, or whether it's their lack of forward, you know, uh, defensive help, the Celtics have an angle every game. And sometimes I feel like this team is so, you know, fixated on getting everyone involved, where they steer away sometimes from what's worked best, which is Brown and Tatum just kind of running the show and just just taking over games. We we've seen it this year, Dallas, Minnesota. When they are when they're in go mode and this offense is running through Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, especially this year with their playmaking, um, which has just been amazing and a huge improvement. Um, I, I really think that that's something they need to do is stop you know stop steering away from from the mismatch or from yeah from the mismatches. I, they'll go to the mismatch for like four minutes in a quarter, and then it'll be like, okay mismatches. You know that we did that that three point time. And you're just kind of like, ah, no, like, and the game opens up. It's so obvious. I mean, that's what opened up the the shooting against Memphis was they started getting aggressive and going to the rim, 
And then the shots start just just raining down. So I do think that's something that they need to work on. But again, I, I, I don't think it's been like catastrophic, right? I don't think when it happens, it's kind of frustrating because again, as Celtics fans, you want to win every single time you play. I mean, every any team. But you know, I, I do think that it is something that you know in the playoffs, man. You got a series against the Hawks, man. You go at Trey Young, you're gonna sweep mm. them, right? It's, it's right. Like you're not gonna go six against them. You're gonna sweep them if you handle your business. That's the thing about the Celtics team is they need to handle their business. There is no way, and I know I'm so fixated on this game, but it, it, to me that game against the Lakers the other night was a huge red flag. Now I'm not saying the sky is falling. The Celtics are, you know, they're not contenders anymore. You're going to have those games, unfortunately, where shots aren't falling, but you need to find other ways to win. Every time Boston kind of got themselves back to within, I think that was a game where – and I know every episode we try to, you know, we kind of allude back to last year's team. And I know this is a different team and a different kind of vibe. But this was a game last year where the Celtics lost where shots weren't falling. They let that affect their defense. Mm-hmm. Their lack of defense allowed the Lakers to it really open up the Lakers game. D'Angelo started getting confident. Uh, uh, who's the other guy? Austin Reeves started to get confident. I mean, you got had guys like Rui Hachimura, who's a 20-something percent three-point shooter, start knocking down threes. You let these guys get complacent and, and, and really adapt into their own game. You get blown out, man. I mean, that should not happen with this Celtics team. I don't care if it's a course of an 82-game season. And it's going to happen. You're fully healthy. National TV. You're hearing LeBron James is out. You can't go like this before the game. You can't. You, you, you cannot do that. And that's going to hurt Boston come playoff time if they continue to do that. Right. Because it hurt them in that Atlanta series. It, it, it hurt them early on in the, in the Philly series when James Harden was missing time. And then, you know, Joel and beat. So that can't happen come April. I'm, I'm glad it happened now. Right. But – you hear Missoula, and I, you know, I, I think Missoula is a very well-spoken guy. You hear Missoula talk about this all the time. You have to build good habits, and you have to let those habits build because if you don't build good habits, come playoff time, you're toast, dude. You're toast. You're absolutely – we saw it in the 2019 Celtics. You know, Gordon Hayward admitted, like, listen, we were, we were focused on everything but winning. Right. We only cared about individual stuff, and I think that goes to – goes to your point a little bit earlier where are the Celtics too a little bit too unselfish you know what I mean like they start to steer away from things and they start to you know so I think these are really good problems to have and I think these are really good conversations to have but it does get to a point where it's like is is all this good gonna hurt the Celtics at times and I think it's a fair question to ask and I do think I mean that's complacency has been something that has just killed Boston I mean, right. just not being able to step on the opponent's neck. Mm. And, I mean, how many times have we seen it? I mean, man, like, game five against Milwaukee that 2022 year. There's been one series that they've done it. One series. You know what series it was? The Brooklyn Nets. Mm. The first round against Brooklyn. They were able, and again, I think there was some Brooklyn's on execution down the stretch. It was terrible, that series. But there was a sense where Boston felt like, Every game they went out there, there was a target on their backs and they needed to prove something. Again, it's a different team, but if you look at every play, literally, like, yes, every playoff series since that Brooklyn Nets series, Bucks, Heat, Warriors, Hawks, Sixers, Heat again. Every time the Celtics have had a chance to win that series and have blown it. All right. Yeah, I mean, game five against Atlanta last yep. year. Five against Philly. Game five against Philly, game seven against game Miami, seven. Yeah. where where I know Jason Tatum got hurt. I know Boston, it was, it was a long stretch. You were down 0-3. Celtics should have never been down 0-3 in that situation regardless. But I, I, I think that these are conversations you need to have. And it's funny, like, you know, the, the viewer or listener can sit here and be, oh, these guys are idiots. These guys are fake fans. Listen, it's not always sunshine and rainbows. We're 38 and 12, but it's not always sunshine and rainbows. And I feel like we wouldn't be doing our jobs correctly if we were only talking about the good. You know what's funny? You say that because uh, you see comments sometimes and people are like, oh, well, you know what? You're posting, oh, Jalen Brown's, you know, doing well now, but you're, you know, posted a stat said, I remember I posted the stat. I think he had 19 assists to 17 turnovers over a four game stretch. Hmm. Posted that and I was like, oh, tough stretch for Brown. Then the next two weeks later, he had like 25 assists, like two turnovers. Hmm. And I posted mm. that, and then I remember I got comments like, oh, my God, like, 
It's, it's like no, it's, it's like, like, like no, it's not gotta about cover the, If up. I want to cover the Celtics, I have to give you every aspect of the Boston Celtics. Otherwise, I'm not analyzing them. I'm just being a fan, which I don't get me wrong. I'm a fan off right. camera. I don't get, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm as much as I'm the, one of the biggest fans you'll meet. But at the end of the day, when you're dissecting the Celtics, and I, that's a great point you made, is you can't just be like, oh, yeah, they're 38 and 12. We are so good. Because quite frankly, Justin, I think I did that the past previous years. I was like, oh, our record's good. There's no warning signs. There's no nothing. Right. We're good. Last year, there were warning red flags that whole year. We just ignored every single one of them. And I think this year, you know, I think we're in a much better direction, like much better direction than we have. Been. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. But it's 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 funny. Like you get those comments and you get those those people. Oh, you got you're like, oh, you're being a fake fan. Fake fan. Fake. <laughs> fake fan. No, I'm still I'm still Celtics rising when we're losing by forty against the you know no, like, doubt. no, 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 no. Doubt. no, no. But it, it, and 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 it's not a knock on the players or anything at all. But like that's that's media. That's the yeah. game. Like yeah. whether you like it or not, that's that it is what it is. You have to you have to you have to talk about the product that's being no doubt. Put and forth. my, my and, dad, it's funny. We'll be at, at home watching the game and they'll stink it up. Right? They'll they'll suck. And my dad will turn off the TV as the game ends. He goes, oh, thank God. I could go to bed. And I'm like, oh, yeah, lucky for you. I got to go sit down for another hour and a half. Talk about this. So fake fans. It's like, oh, what do you right. I don't know. Yeah. Right. And and listen, like, it with when it comes to the Celtics, the Celtics are one of the deepest teams, if not the deepest team. They're one of the best teams, if not already the best team. Uh, there's teams like New York. There's teams like the Clippers who are rising out of nowhere. You can even throw the Cavaliers. Um, and then teams kind of falling back down to earth, like like um, Indiana and like like Orlando, still teams that you need to 100%. worry about. But if you're Boston, and f- here's the thing, and I, I I believe I said this on a post game show um, not too long ago, uh, the number one important thing for me, and I mentioned it earlier uh, with certain individual players, is consistency, and you want to see consistency, uh, not only just individually but total wise as well, winning wise as well. I think you go back two years ago to that championship team. Celtics didn't start winning games until now. February, <laughs> like, like right now, now. Yeah. like January, yeah. February, yeah. March. And then last year, the Celtics got off to this historic, unbelievable start, mm-hmm. and then they kind of slipped. Right. This year, I want to see, and I do think we're seeing it, the winning at a consistent level and at a consistent pace throughout the course of the season. Like – I don't want to see the Celtics win 40 games before the All Star break and then plateau and start to get oh we're five games we're five games up against the box we're six games up against the 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 you know whatever the Sixers like we can we're chilling no you you want to go into April you want to go to into April the final five six games that they play in April as rested and as healthy as possible yeah. if you have to rest those last three games you can rest Tatum. And you could play, and you could play, you know, Hauser more minutes, right. you know, get him some reps before the playoffs. Right. That's so important. Remember two years ago, the Celtics I, were running in mud the entire playoffs. And I get it. They went to the finals. I understand that. They were two games away. They were, they were you know, a few minutes away from a 3-1 to one series lead. I get it. But there's no denying the Celtics were running in mud because they had to – it was an uphill battle, right? Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, Robert Williams, Al Horford – that a, a regular starting five was playing on game 82. Memphis Grizzlies. Memphis yep. Grizzlies. Last year, the Celtics were able to rest a little bit, but it didn't come until like the last couple games of the season. You know, Peyton Pritchard had the triple-double against Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like this year, I, I would much rather see like the two-way guys get no doubt. You know no what doubt. I'm saying? No and I think this I, – I don't know where you're going to take the direction of the show here, Rob, and I don't mean to rush it at any point, but this is also – where I want to bring in trade targets because I'm going to start off by saying this. There's no trade out there right now that the Celtics absolutely need. And when I say that, I'm saying when the Celtics make a deal, it's not going to be this jaw-dropping, stargazing move. There's no Derek White coming to Boston. Correct. But there's there's no Derek White coming to Boston. Needle threading move, in my opinion. And when I say that, I mean, we're going to go after an an insurance player. We're going to go after somebody that can fill in for Al Horford on a second night of a back-to-back, that can fill in for Kristaps Porzingis. Remember last year, the Celtics made this move just before the trade deadline ended, which they're very famous for. 
Here's from Mike Muscala uh, out of Oklahoma City. We traded Justin Jackson and like a second round pick for Mike Muscala. Everybody said, "Oh, Mike Muscala, like what's he going to do?" He's going to give Al Horford and Blake Griffin a second night, and Robert Williams, who was very injury prone at the time, off on a second night of a back to back. Going to get those three veteran players and those three injury prone players some rest. So Mike Muscala, Mike Muscala, who's a very playable player, comes in, gives Al Horford the rest. And there we go. The Celtics got their rest for Al Horford. That, to me, is going to be the type of player that the Celtics are going to go after. Not Mike Muscala exactly, but an insurance player, somebody who can kind of lift the leverage a little bit. Um, the only move I think the Celtics make that I think is beneficial to the team, I would like to see the Celtics go after Andre Drummond. And people are like, Andre Drummond, like, listen, First of all, if you're going to compare him to Kelly Olynyk, he's younger than Kelly Olynyk. Really? He's been in the league longer. He's younger. Kelly Olynyk also, to make Kelly Olynyk work, he's under some taxpayer mid-level exception player where uh, he's making 12 million, but if he gets bought out somehow, uh, somehow the Celtics can buy it, right. buy, uh, sign him. Um, but if not, you're going to have to make that contractually work. And I would not want to give up Al Horford. In, in a Sam Hauser for Kelly Olynyk, as much as I love Kelly Olynyk, I also think the Celtics at the big man position have plenty of floor stretchers. Al Horford, uh, Luke Cornett could play the high pick and roll well. Uh, Chris Seth Porzingis, we know what he can do. Um, Andre Drummond fits your need. He's a big veteran player with experience, maybe not championship experience, but experience. He's also a rebounder. He's also somebody who's going to get in there and tough. How many times, God damn it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to the Lakers game. How many times did the Lakers push out the lead because the Celtics couldn't close out a defensive possession with the rebound? So many. That's an two, issue, one, one too many. And you know what? So this is, this is where I stand with the deadline. I do agree with you. I personally, if you want my you know, 100% honest truth take on what the Celtics do in the deadline, I agree. I think it's an insurance policy player. I think it's a Mike Muscala type of move. However, I do think there are moves to be made. Because I do think the options, the market, and I've been honing on this guy all past month. Lonnie Walker is is a guy on Brooklyn who's him. making right around the vet, vet's minimum, who's scoring 13 points per game on 19 on 19 minutes. So I think if and, and again, it, it really it goes to like you know how much do you value our bench right now? Because this is something I've been saying on the post game shows. The Celtics are playing money ball on their bench. Like straight up Oakland A's 2000 and what was that 2002 something like that. They're playing Moneyball, and again they're they're the Yankees up front, but their bench is money. It's the Oakland A's, and they have to think, where am I getting a bang for my buck? And Hauser, for example, bang for your buck. You're paying him two million dollars. That's a bang for your buck. What he's giving you, Cornet, bang for your buck. And and I'm not a Cornet guy. I know I'm not a Cornet guy, but at the end of the day, bang for your buck. What he's doing. For what you're paying him is honestly, it's like why would you why would you get rid of that? You, there's no reason to get rid of that. You know who's not a bang for your buck? Peyton Pritchard. Four point six mm. million dollars owed to Peyton Pritchard. It's only gonna go up. Only gonna go up. And I, and you know what? I think out of the players on the Celtics bench, Pritchard is the only player that holds kind of a real market. I think you could actually put Pritchard in a pick to get something in return, whether whatever it is. But so that's where I'm at with the with the deadline is. You know, you got to play money ball here. So I love Drummond. I think if you can acquire Drummond, I'd do it. Uh, I think he's just a bigger, more physical um, Cornet. And I think Cornet being your fourth string is is awesome. Because then, then you can rest both KP and Al at times. And, you know, Luke's still the backup big. You let Andre get in there, bang, kind of bang some guys up a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it works. So... Um, I think that's something I'm, I, I would be definitely interested in seeing. Olenek, again, I don't. I, the contract, it's got to be. He's under twelve point six. So unless Brad calls up Danny and's like, "Hey, listen, Danny, I'm going to send you some picks. You buy him out. See if Kelly's okay with that," which could actually realistically happen. Um, I don't see that happening. And then the other one's Delon Delon Wright, correct? Out of uh, Washington, he's a guard. Uh, he could play the wing, but. If I'm Boston, I'm steering away from the guards. I think you're 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 good on guards, especially if you're gonna keep Peyton Pritchard. I don't know if they're gonna keep Pritchard, uh, but here's the thing: um, if you're the Celtics, and I wouldn't be so quick to make a move. This team is has won 38 of their first 50 games. They're 
I don't know the exact record, 21 and 22 and 3 at home, whatever it is. It's really hard, really hard to to trade away what's not broken. It's really, you know, don't don't fix it if it ain't broke. Right. There are tradable pieces on the team. There are pieces where we could get stronger at. If I'm Boston, I'm not even thinking about. I'm really not. I'm not thinking about trading O'Shea Brissett. You want bench depth, you keep O'Shea Brissett and give him more than a two minute and 14 second stint on the basketball court. There's games where we've lacked energy and we've needed to go deeper into the bench and we've gone to everybody but O'Shea Brissett. O'Shea Brissett is a must play in the rotation, at least in the regular season here. I mean, come on. I think he's probably the most talented bench player they have. He, he's on, he does everything. He, to me, is... If he had better consistent shooting, because we he was a great shooter in Indiana, so if his shooting could be right. you know a little bit more consistent. Right. He would be what we wanted Aaron Neesmith to be yeah. in this position. You know me, big Aaron Neesmith, big, dude, big, yeah, huge, yeah. as big as they come. Yeah, right. But Aaron Neesmith needed this go to a rebuilding franchise where he can get an opportunity. He wasn't getting an opportunity behind Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Is there? And the, and the pressure was too high for him. The pressure was just and too high. Now we're starting to question Peyton Pritchard in that position. Is this starting to get too much for him? Right. They traded Malcolm Brogdon away. They traded Marcus Smart away. He right. And that's what Kemba I've been saying Walker. is Pritchard could go to a team like Washington and mm. give you 15 points per game. I have full confidence that Peyton Pritchard can give you 15 points, three or four rebounds, six or seven assists. No doubt. That's not going to happen on Boston. Mm. The opportunity just isn't there. I'm out on Pritchard. I am. I think that I think there is so much potential in Peyton Pritchard elsewhere, just like Aaron Neesmith. I don't think that it's going to work out in Boston. And again, when you're in a season that's this important for this, like that, that this one is for the Celtics, you can't wait. If you're if you're Brad, the last thing you want to be thinking in June is. Damn, I should have made this move. Right. That's the last thing you want to be thinking after making all the after arrows. making all right. Like there is so one ring this year is you're set for the next ten. And again, you know, but theoretically speaking, pressure wise, front office, you get one. Those draft picks don't mean nothing. It doesn't matter who you, you who you pick. You get the ring this year. It doesn't matter. That's why personally, I'm all in on Pritchard and some picks to bring someone in. Drummond, I don't know, I wouldn't give a Pritchard in a first for Drummond, but you know, whoever it may be, I, I think that that should be Brad's approach, is listen, if you look at the roster, Pritchard, it, I mean, what role does he play? And I was talking about this because you got two starting point guards in your starting lineup. Why is it that we need to sub in another point guard? And I'm interested, maybe this happens in the playoffs, but for some reason, Missoula loves this whole like, I'm running two point guards out there. And right, sometimes I'm two, two. right. Sometimes I'm like, if you just let Drew or, or D White run the show as the one, you then get to slot O'Shea into the into the rotation, and so say the because the first two out for the Celtics are Holiday and Tatum, mm. and the first two that come in are Horford and usually Hauser. Hauser, yeah. So think about that. White in in that unit has been so good. The White mm. Brown Hauser Horford Porzingis unit has been phenomenal. I think there's a correlation between. When the Celtics have one point guard in with the second guys, just can feed the second unit, right? White can White and Holiday can get Hauser the ball in his spots, can find O'Shea on the cuts. Pritchard, it's like when the ball's in Pritchard's hands and you're having Drew Holiday stand there, you're taken away from what Drew. And it, it's just you know that's it's not make or break, but it's just like the, the things inside the margins that I think like you know that's something that's happening that if you move Pritchard and bring in a you know, a, a big man help or maybe a bigger guard. It's the bigger guard's role is defense when he's out there. It's not just like if you're hot, you're hot. You're going to play if you're shooting well. But if you're not, you hold no value to us, you know? Right. It also, it, 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 going back to my point about how tough it must be for Brad to kind of, you know, make a move, even if it's just one player, uh, especially when you're doing this good, it, the grass isn't always greener. So Celtic can go out and get an Andre Drummond, and it could just work out to, to nothing. Listen, right. the Celtics were extremely, and I, I, I'll tell you, they were extremely fortunate to have Derek White turn out to be the way Derek White has been. Right. Especially going to the NBA Finals his first half season he was here. He was living in a hotel. His, 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 his you know, fiance was, was in labor, and, and 
it, it was just a mess for him. He was living out of a hotel. So for him to come in and play the way he did, remember that Denver game, his Celtic debut? He had like 15 points. Yeah. So like he fit in seamlessly. And right. Was like, oh, geez. Like, yeah. Whoa. And then he comes out last year and have the year had have the year he had, and then this year he's all star caliber player, which we'll get to any minute. Here. Yep, yep. I mean, <laughs> I, I, it's it's just you you know it baffles my mind that you know Derek White is, is so quickly turned so good into the Celtic system. So you do have to look at that as well. The grass isn't always greener, you know. Just because you're bringing in a player you think might really help the team, right? It, you know, ner- it's kind of nerve wracking because if he doesn't. Then you, you got rid of somebody who's a great chemistry player like a Luke Cornette or a Peyton Pritchard. Right. And, you know, you're stuck with somebody who skill-wise might not be as good as well as locker room. He's not adapted into it yet. So there's risks to it. But there's also, you know, the, the glass half full, glass half empty type situation when you when you deal with the trade. But um, comes to the trade deadline, I think we're all in agreement. Expect nothing. Jaw-dropping, st- star-eyed, right. you know. Oh, we're winning the title now. Like, yeah. You know. Adding without subtracting. That's Correct. my thing. Right? right. With the deadline, add without subtracting. But you, you brought us into a beautiful segue here, Justin, like you always do. Derek White. Mm. Porzingis, too. But mm-hmm. D. White kind of had the bigger campaign. So, yeah, he's an all-star now. Right. So to, to, f- to fill you in, uh, Embiid and, um, and Randall go out. They get hurt. They're missing time. Embiid is missing significant time. Randall should return, I, I believe, after, after the all-star break. Um, and B, they claim he might return, but quite frankly, those big men in their meniscus take it from a Celtics fan. Uh, it's, it's messy, messy, messy. Yeah. So two reserves, replacement reserves, get to come in. Um, one of which was just announced, both of which were just announced, one of which was Scotty Barnes. Mm. The other one is Trey Young, which Trey Young is like, and we're going to get into it, and I don't know how you feel about it. So... Personally, you ask me who the, the next two out were, and because it was one forward, one guard, I would have told you Porzingis and Derek White, but that's maybe the bias in me. So I'm not too mad, and I don't know where I don't know where you are at. I'm not too mad with Trey Young. No, I'm not. I, I I think it's it's I I understand the logic behind them. There's no denying that they're having one hell of a season. I just was pushing for Derek. White. Yeah. <laughs> Although I will say this, I strongly disagree with Scotty Barnes. I strongly disagree with Scotty Barnes. Kristaps Porzingis has been the Celtics' X factor, although, you know, Drew Holiday still exists. But, I mean, he has changed the game for Tatum and Brown. They're 38 and 12, and he's averaging 20 points per game. I get he hasn't played a whole lot. I mean, he's played a good amount, though. But it's like, Scotty Barnes, really? I mean, what is he doing in Toronto that's all star worthy? That's a plant. I would have put Jimmy Butler in over. That's a plant. Yeah. And and Brian Scalabrini of NBC Sports Boston said this on the postgame show the other night how. And I agreed with him 100%. I think great, like, great analysis, great thought, and it, and it turned out to be true. Um, there's no Canadian, no Toronto Raptor in the All-Star game this year. That kind of, you know, the interest <laughs> yeah. isn't, you know, yeah. from, the, from Canada. It's a business. Interest, it's a business. Yeah, it's a, it is a business. Yeah. And, and Scotty Barnes is having a great year, but there's players that probably would have made the All-Star team before him. But at the same time, now you draw in that big crowd from Canada. Nah, yeah. You know, I get it. They have Shy Gildas Alexander. You know, I, I understand that. But right. I'm saying, like, somebody Toronto, from their home right, team. Right. To bring in Scotty Barnes, a business marketing standpoint, brilliant on, on, on Adam Silver's end. Yeah. Trey Young having a solid season. Here's the thing, though. I, I can't stand the NBA not awarded, awarding winning. I can't. Yeah. I, I get it. I, I, I get, oh, well, they already have. Like, you, you have two all-stars, and, the, you know, the, the, the Clippers have two all-stars, and the Timberwolves. Listen, the Atlanta Hawks, and I've said this to you many times off camera, the Atlanta Hawks got to blow it up. Right. The Atlanta Hawks are, are worse than mid. Usually they're mid. They're worse than mid. Right. I, I, I give them credit for taking us to six games. That's also Boston's fault. That, no way in, in we swept hell them. We swept should them. Them. they have gone to six games. Maybe right, listen, five. Trey Young doesn't hit that shot. We win in five, and we shouldn't have won one in five. We didn't dog at game three. Okay, whatever. That's in the past. <laughs> the Atlanta Hawks just don't cut it for me. They don't, man. They just stink. I'm they right just, there with you. They just tick me off, right? Because it, it's one of those teams where, okay, on paper, like Clint Capella, Trey Young, Dejounte Murray, like throw in Bogdanovich. Like, oh, that's a pretty good team. They made it to the conference finals a few years ago. Clearly a fluke. Um, I mean, at what point, at what point do statistics become not impressive? Because I think that 
you, I, I agree with you completely. Um, winning is a big factor in the All Star game, in my opinion. Um, All stars are winners, man. They are, and I think that when you look at Trey Young, it's a lot of empty stats. What was so impressive about the 2018 James Harden was he was putting up those stats while also propelling his team to winning games. It was like balls in Harden's hands. He's putting up 36, and he's going to win you the damn game. That's what was so impressive about what James Harden was doing. Guys like Luka, and again, Luka's gotten there before. Luka's so young and honestly on a different planet as Trey Young. But you look at some of these stats, and you see their records, and you're thinking to yourself, well, hold on. That doesn't check out. You're doing something wrong. If, like, the usage rate is just absurdly high to not be winning. So it makes me think, Trey Young, he's got the ball in his hand a lot, man. You're not winning? That's probably on you. If the ball's in your hand the most and you're not winning the game, then what are you doing wrong? There's something the star player is doing wrong. And I think that, again, less so, Trey, because I do think to a certain degree, like, uh, it's tough because White, White, White has had a great year. It's yeah. tough. Yeah, I, I mean, again, it could be the bias in us, like I'll admit. Uh, but I, I just, I, I'll forever be confused about what's going on in Atlanta. Thank God we're not Hawks Talk Weekly because <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I just, I genuinely, I, you know, I, I was, I, I, I don't know how we got through our first season together. You think when, they moved Dejounte? I, I think they 100. percent I, and you know why? I think they should move Dejounte. Right. He's playing right, great right now. That trade stock is going through the roof. Through the right roof. Now. Yep. I, I don't think it's working out with Clint Capella. I don't think it's working out with Trey Young. You think you move? You should move Trey. I'm not saying you should. I'm right. Saying I wouldn't be surprised. If you look into it. Trey's a tough guy and, to build yeah, but, around. But to me, you shouldn't be. You you personally shouldn't be so. Like oh jeez, like really? You think they should move Trey? Remember Joel Embiid. Right. Right. So it's like Joel Embiid's a guy. He ain't. Win- he's not winning. Barely get past the second round. Hasn't can't gone past get past the second. second round. <laughs> Haven't gone past second. Barely got past, past the first. Can't right. get past the second. So it's like okay, well the ball's in your hands the most. Right, it's probably your fault, and that's that's been my point. And it's like you've been through a gazillion coaches, so you right. can't blame coaching. Like, yeah, yeah. So it's like you know, and Quinn Snyder has been a, a, a phenomenal coach in this league, uh, most notably in Utah, and had a very solid se- second half of the season last year, just being thrusted in after Nate McMillan was fired. Right. So for me, Atlanta is going to be this team that I, I I just don't understand how they somehow squeak into the play in. I think right. it's because the bottom of the East is so weak with the Detroits and the Washingtons and right. the and the and the they're, Charlottes. They're going to be in the the Bulls mix, I think. Them and the Bulls, the Bulls, and the, Bulls the Toronto, Nets. the Brooklyn Nets, right. like that mix. Um, I think Orlando. Uh, you know, if we're going to really quickly ramble off on the East, I think Orlando and Indiana are better than playing teams, or at least the higher playing seeds. They're right. definitely they're they're past. I'm going to give them their props, not because they beat us this season, but they are legitimate playoff teams in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so well, this brings up a good topic for me because when you look at the 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 Eastern Conference right now, pretty surprising. You got Cleveland at two, mm. Milwaukee at three, <laughs> New York at four. Yeah. And then Philly at five, obviously no Embiid. They're probably, honestly, they might keep dropping without Embiid. It might get pretty ugly in Philly pretty fast. Um, and then Indiana, Orlando, and Miami. So that's the top eight. Who, who do you think is the biggest threat to us? You ask me, the biggest threat to the Boston Celtics is the New York Knicks. Mm. Maybe Cleveland, maybe Cleveland. But I, So here's I the thing. Know. I think the Knicks are up there. First of all, I think it's always going to be the Miami Heat. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yep. like the Heat lost seven straight games, and every single game I was like, oh, no, because they're just <laughs> dropping to the eighth seed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> you know? That's a good way to put it. You know? That's a good way to put so it. So it's like, oh, man, like the Heat, you know, you like to see them lose, but at the same time, at what cost? Because yeah, now they're playing like, us in the first like, round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but I look at these teams, and I think Cleveland – is a ma- and I said this last year. I, I I'm gonna say it this year. They're a matchup nightmare. That double big of Mobley and and Jared Allen. The only issue with them is those guys can't stay healthy for their lives. Right, and Garland and, and Mitchell are and then, tough guards. And then Max add Max Drews, who torched us oh, in the conference finals yeah. last year. Like Isaac Okoro's having a, a, a stellar year right. uh, for them. Um, the only downside is they lost a really good veteran in Ricky Rubio. Yeah, um, which. I, I get it. He, you know, he wasn't playing, but he he's been a hell of a veteran for them. 
Uh, so I think Cleveland, but I'm right with you with New York. Jalen Brunson is – listen, I shouldn't be saying this as a Celtics fan. The Knicks are a treat to watch. Yeah, they bro, are an bro, absolute, yep. As a basketball fan, as a realist, the, the New York Knicks are a treat to watch. Knicks deserve Brunson, man. Uh, <laughs> Knicks I'm fans deserve you, Brunson. I remember the phone call right when the – and to be fair, you and I didn't assess this. We didn't – this was natural reaction, looked at the names. We thought – the Toronto are like, oh, man, this is great for Toronto. Man, right. you will quickly R.J. Barrett. Like, right. oh, man, like Toronto. And then you actually them. look at it. And, and then, then you, you actually look at, look at it. it. And yeah. then you look at it on paper, and then you look how they, how OG and Anobi and Precious Achua have been playing in New York. And the only thing New York has right now, the, the issue is, is they can't get Mitchell Robinson healthy because Robinson's an underrated center, in my opinion. Yeah, but, but yeah. No, I, yeah. And, and, I agree. And, you know, Hartenstein's playing well. The only thing with them is – I love Tibbs. You know me. I'm a big Tibbs guy. But the minutes that he has those Knicks playing, those Knicks players, Oof. is brutal. Yeah. And that might hurt them come playoff time. Well, I think it will be interesting to see what New York does at the deadline because I think there's another move to be made in New York. They got Fournier Here's, that's sitting the on their bench. It's nearly mm-hmm. 20 mil. Waiting to get flipped. Right. Waiting to get flipped into a cap holder. <laughs> it shocked me he hasn't been. Yeah. Yet. And, and I think that that's something that the Knicks could do. So... You ask me who's the biggest, and it's funny because I've been thinking about this, and it's the more I think about it, the more I'm like, oh, no, like I, we might see Philly in the second round now if they fall 4-5. Milwaukee might fall 4-5 second round against Milwaukee. I'm like, oh, geez, second round against Milwaukee. Mm, okay, nice. Mm. I don't really want to see Cle- – I don't want to go through Cleveland one round and then New York another. Like if – which very much so ha- – quite, quite frankly, I think – Philly's out of the top five now. They're going to be a six or below. They're just not going to win enough games. Um, they're only a their three game lead over over um, Indiana. I think Indiana will catch them. Mm. So I think my my prediction is Boston finishes one. I think Milwaukee still finishes two. I think Cle- Cleveland finishes three. I think New York finishes four. I think Indiana finishes five. I think Philly finishes six. And then Orlando, Miami, Chicago are kind of all like, hey, who cares? So it's like I care. I don't want Miami <laughs> or Orlando. <laughs> right, but it's like um, I the more I think about it, the more I'm like, ooh, I would like to see Milwaukee in round two, opposed to seeing Cleveland or New York round two. Mm. I think New York or Cleveland, and again, it depends what Randall you're getting. It, it could be a nightmare, man. I I don't really want to see. I don't really want to see both of them. I think Milwaukee right now is at their lowest of lows that they've been at in a while. They're, they're a mess. They are an absolute mess. And here's the thing. You almost lost Middleton and Brooke Lopez. Right. Brooke almost went to Houston. Right. Uh, Middleton almost left. Right. You re-signed those guys to contracts. Neither one of those guys can stay healthy, most notably and Chris old. Middleton. And they're old. And, and I'm not going to speak so much on Brooke Lopez because I know he's going through some personal stuff right now. But, I mean – then you go and you trade Drew Holiday. Which was just looking back at it, idiotic. Which it's like, if you're, I mean, Drew Holiday nearly won you that series against Boston. He definitely won you that game five. I'll tell you that right now. Yep. You just lost Marcus Smart, Celtics being. Wouldn't you think you'd keep Drew Holiday? Right. But you bought the name Damian Lillard. Right. Dame is an all-star starter. This and listen, I'm not hating on the Bucks. Like I think, I do think the Bucks, talent-wise, have a phenomenal team. It's just not clicking. But see, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't. I, I here's the thing. Here is the thing, Rob. I don't believe in the Milwaukee Bucks, and I, get, I get it. Doc won us a title 15 years ago. <laughs> oh, Doc, yeah, Doc's, yeah, Doc's time's done. Doc is not the coach. I tried telling the Bucks fans. They said, oh, you're just a hater. Mind your own business. Stick with the Celtics. Listen. Listen. <laughs> Griffin was not the problem. Right. Griffin was not the problem. And uh, believe what you want, that coach was not the issue. Well, and you know what's funny? It's funny because you sit there and you look at Milwaukee's situation, all right? Reason one, the organization gave as to why Adrian Griffin was fired. The defense was bad. Okay, well, you traded a top one percentile guard defender for a bottom, you know, bottom one percentile guard defender. No wonder your defense got bad. And then the second reason was experience. Well, hold on. Hold on. You knew the stakes coming into this year. 
You just traded Drew Holiday, who was the. I mean, talk about heart and soul, man. He said he wanted to retire a buck. He won a ring for the buck. <laughs> Two days later, right? Trade, like, <laughs> so it's like you hired a rookie head coach. It's like where's the law? And then you fire him, which quite frankly I would have not have done. You're, you're playing good. You fire him. And then what do you do? You go you go hire Doc Rivers. Do, do what this screams to me. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to predict this right here, right now. This is what's going to happen with the Milwaukee Bucks. They're going to finish as the two seed. They're going to make the second round. They're going to be up in the second round. They're going to blow the lead. And then what we're going to hear is midseason acquisition with Doc Rivers. You know, give him an offseason. We're going to add a couple pieces. Maybe move Middleton. And they're going to run it back. And you know what's going to happen? identical they're going to be the one seed next year they're going to be great in the regular season just like every doc rivers team is and then the playoffs are going to roll around justin and the milwaukee bucks are yet again under doc rivers going to screw it up and then Giannis is leaving and you're going to sit there and that organization is going to think to themselves how did we screw this up this badly mm. i mean the time's ticking the clock is ticking for for milwaukee watched the game last year uh, Milwaukee uh, and, and Indiana and even the Milwaukee announcers uh, were saying how time's time's ticking here for this Milwaukee Bucks team. Yeah, they won a title a few years ago. They're, old. They're only getting older. They're only getting older. And, 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 and when you get older, not only do you start to decline, your body becomes more injury prone. And when you're already injury prone, you're toast. I mean, Dame's what, 34? He's up there. I, mean, I don't know his exact age. But, hey, dude, listen. I think they thought it was going to be sunshine and rainbows when Damian Lillard and Giannis right. and Coop Look, man, like, like I don't blame them. That's a, on paper one of the best duos I've seen in a while. But on court, if it doesn't match, listen, you're not going to – when you get to a seven-game playoff series, especially against a Boston, especially against a team like go out west, go out against the Clippers or, or the Denver Nuggets, you're not going to win a seven-game series outscoring the other team. Technically, you are, yes. <laughs> but if you have no defense to go along with your offense and you're just – and you, your plan every night is, oh, Dame's going to get 35, Giannis is going to get 30, and Chris Middleton and or Brooke Lopez has to get 20-plus, it's not going to work. Look at the look at the Kings last year. It's, They're right. the highest-scoring like team, I think, in NBA history. Like ever. And they, like they got ever. bounced around one because the – I mean, obviously, Cur Steph Curry's greatness played a real factor into it because the Warriors got stops. But – you 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 can't go into the playoffs with a horrendous defense, and I think horrendous is an understatement in Milwaukee. Their defense is just atrocious, terrible. <laughs> and you know what? When that move happened, you know what I told you? I said I told everyone. I said this on my, all my social medias. I liked the move against the other twenty seven teams, but the other three, two or three teams that Milwaukee has to play to win a championship. No way. That makes no sense. No way in hell does that make any sense. And they gave up Drew. Right. The guy the guy to get them over the hump, they right. gave up. And I think it's like, okay, yes, you get the – yes, okay, Damian Lillard can score 30 while Drew is averaging 14 a game. I get it. Right. But Drew's also winning, and yeah. he's also impacting the game on both ends of the floor a lot more than Damian Lillard. Here's a stat for you. And this is very Boston Celtics-esque. Lose, losses versus teams under 500 this season for the top four seeds in each conference. Boston has two. Cleveland has two. The Knicks have one. Flip it out to the West. Oklahoma has five. Minnesota has four. The Clippers have four. Denver has four. The Milwaukee Bucks have seven losses. Seven losses. Yes, seven out of their 17 losses, almost half, have been to bad teams. And when earlier in this episode, what were we talking about? We were talking about, you know, handling business, right? Do, playing down to your competition. Something that the Boston Celtics struggled with for years. I mean, honestly, it's probably two, 2018 was the last year they didn't play down. Because once Kyrie and, and Hayward were down, they, they were playing with a chip on their shoulder. Since then, they have played down to their competition until this year. Obviously, they've been much better. I mean, that's a red flag. Talk about, like, that's something Celtics fans ignored for so long. Was We said to, we told ourselves, oh, well, I mean, you're not going to play the Detroit Pistons in the playoffs. It's like, no, but those are habits you build. Right, and and especially now that they added the play-in 
teams where there's four seeds that can make it into the first round. Yeah. First of all, when I tell you I don't want to see Orlando or Miami, I'm not saying that they're going to beat us in a seven-game series, but typically first-seeded teams in the first round play the eighth seed. You want to get that series over four, maybe five if that team, you know, luck usually you see the underdogs win game one or win right. a game three or right. something yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. keep the series alive type thing. I don't think that those two teams will beat us in a seven-game series, but those are two teams that I think could give Boston yeah. troubles and give Boston a lot longer first-round series than a potential Toronto or a Mil or a uh, Chicago or you know say um, you know I don't know one of those teams squeaking. I'd, at, at I'd the bottom. like to think that at this point, the Celtics, from what I've seen against Miami, we str we struggled against Miami in the, in the regular season last year too. I'd, I'd, I'd like to feel a little bit more confident against Miami. Still don't prefer not to see them. Orlando, I'm not really scared about. Um, I just think they're so young that, yeah, they can, you know. They're just a fun they're team. They're just a fun team, and they can kind of rough us up in the regular season here and there. Right? They got the best of us in the in-season tournament game. But I think once the playoffs roll around and you, Jason Tatum walks in that door and Jalen Brown walks through that locker room door and the Celtics garden crowd, you got to come to the park, play on the parquet in the playoffs. Playoff parquet, man. It's tough. And – I think that I think they could win a game, uh, be sneaky next year. I think they're going to be great, uh, but yeah, I'm not scared. Miami, I, you're right. I mean, Miami gives you the shivers. Miami's always going to be there. Yeah. I don't care who's on the roster. I don't care what type of season they're having. Right. They're always going to be there. They struggled in the play-in tournament last year. Kind of had a scare. Uh, that's how we got Atlanta. You know, we were kind of planning that we were going to have Miami, and then Atlanta all of a sudden comes out, uh, and then you, you you saw the type of season Miami had the postseason Miami had they go on to the finals and you know force a game five in the finals and you know whatever but Miami's always going to be there right and that's the annoying thing so this is something before we close out here I want to talk about because we have talked about the Celtics ability or inability rather in the years past to close out games and series and regular season games against bad teams this January they've had some rough losses but to good teams Nuggets, Bucks, Clippers, Lakers. Four teams they lost. Obviously, the Lakers aren't, aren't very good, right? No, no Braun and AD. However, that was a home game. So three out of those four games were losses at home. They started 20-0 at home since they've been 3-3. Three and three. So it's – and this is something I mentioned in the, um, in, in the postgame show when we were going back home and we lost to Denver. After that game, I said – because we went on the road for a little bit. I said – I'm kind of concerned that this might, like, have some shockwave effect to it, where it's like, oh, you you win 20 straight, you lose the first one. It's kind of like, oh, right, like the streak's done. And there's, I feel, like, I feel like we're in that grace period where they were kind of just like recoup, like recalibrating at home almost. But I mean, how how, I mean, we got spanked on the road to the Bucks. We. Barely lost the Nuggets, and we played terrible. They played you, great. You know what? I'm I'm gonna stop you right there. That box game. Right. I'm gonna be honest with you. You don't care about it. No, well, I I don't, but I do at the same time. Because right. we said it last year when we did the box. Box were playing five games, seven nights, second night of a back to back. We same as same situation here with us. And we said this about the Bucks last year. There is in no world right. should the Bucks be 35 points behind us. There's no world the Celtics should have been 40 points below. There's no world the Celtics starting five should have been benched for an entire second half and play your preseason unit in the entire second half on a national televised game. Right. So that game, yes, there were some excuses to go along with that. That that fact that could have factored in. But at the same time, we shouldn't have been 40 points down. It was a bad loss for the Celtics. But there are factors to win the game. And I don't think, you know, getting to a playoff series, there's not going to be a game where the Celtics or Bucks are up 40 on each other. No. So let's face it. There's no. not. And what about Denver? Because personally, with, for me, Denver was like, you play, you didn't shoot very well. You lost it at the end. Jokic and Murray, 34 plus each, over 60% shooting each. You lost by two at home. Denver was a game where I said earlier in the episode, you went away from what was working. Right. Jason yeah. Tatum and, and, and Chris F. Porzingis. Yeah. Porzingis. 14 first quarter points. He only scored seven in the final three quarters. Right. Why'd you go away from that? He was exploiting the matchup. He was playing really well. Celtics made some errors down the stretch. You lose by two. It's funny. You know what's funny? It's funny the media outlets and stuff. How, uh, you know, they come on and one game, you know, Celtics could beat the Pistons. Oh, Missoula's coach of the year. They'll lose to the defending champions. Their first home loss of the season by two. 
Missoula's a bird brain. The Celtics don't know what they're doing. They're not contending. I will say this. I will say this on Joe Missoula. He has tendencies that scare me. There are tendencies that scare me. Um, quite frankly, if you say fire Joe Missoula, you just you can't. You can't. It's stupid. You, you couldn't. You asked my whole take on Joe Missoula. Do I think he should have been promoted to that coach? I really don't. I think that he needed some more time in the league to adjust. However, he was promoted to the head coach. So when I think about Joe Missoula, here's my thing. One, you can't fire him. You need some continuity in Boston, right? Um, you, you can't go four coaches in four years. You ride with Joe. I love that. I just think Joe, like every player on the Celtics team, has good games and bad games. And I think that's part of being a young coach in the league. Now, the question is, can they afford having a young coach? Probably not. But I don't think I've seen anything from Joe that's, that I think is going to be championship like, like costly. I think the third quarter in the lack of timeouts is actually a real problem. I mean, it happened in Memphis. We're up by 22. Memphis puts the lead down to 13. No timeout. And again, it's like Boston did. Their players figured it out, and they extended the lead against the G League Memphis Grizzlies team. But, dude, if, if that's Denver and you don't call a timeout, I mean, your job as the coach is to get your team back on track. All right, guys, hold on. Let's take, you know. So it's like I don't know if we're going to see in the playoffs. If you remember correctly, games one and two against Miami, we held the lead, 10-point lead in games one and two. And they went on those runs, and there was no timeouts, and there were no adjustments. So, again – how much will Joe Missoula learn? I don't know. But I, I think if anyone says fire Joe Missoula, you can't fire Joe Missoula. He's done a great job. They're 38 and 12. It's just, you know, he's got to get some progressions down. Just like a player, right? Just like Jason Tatum has down games and, and good games and bad games. Right. right? It's, it's I think third quarters fall on the players, in my opinion. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the effort, the effort from the players – it has to be there. I think it's Coming both. Out. I don't think it's just Missoula. I think it's both. But yeah, I, I it, listen. Jason Tatum needs to. Go, first of all, you got to go to Jason Tatum more. Hundred percent. I can't believe I'm saying. Hundred percent. I can't believe I'm saying. Hundred percent. Talking MVP caliber player, Jason Tatum, and they're going away from him. I get it. There's other weapons on the court for sure. That third quarter, Jason Tatum's got to get going. JT specifically has to get going in that third quarter. He needs to set the tone. Right. And the Celtics need to. And this is especially when they're down at the half. They need to come out in that third quarter. There's sometimes, some games, first five minutes of the third quarter could dictate the game. I get runs can happen. I get, you, you know, you still have a quarter and a half to play. You're not going to come out the first five minutes with any energy. Boom. That other team's going to take that momentum and ride. So it's like, you know, and then, and then you come out, and then if you're up at the half, which on most cases Celtics are up at the half, you need to keep applying that pressure. You can't, that word complacent comes back. You can't get complacent, especially against a team like the Denver Nuggets or against a team like Miami, uh, Milwaukee, Philly, teams you're going to see in the playoffs, whether it's the first, second, or third round. So I think that's important. That's a habit to build. But, you know, we're sitting here 38-12, and 12, and we're kind of nitpicking a little bit. But I feel like the third quarter thing is not a nitpick. I feel like everybody at home can agree that these third quarter struggles, if there's an eyebrow to raise, if there's an issue to be addressed about the Boston Celtics right now, it's the third quarters and how consistently we want them to be consistent. Not that type of consistent. No, not consistently Not bad. that type no. of consistent. Right. So that's something they need to figure out. No doubt. And again, I don't think it's just, it takes everyone, right? The responsibility falls on everyone. I agree, man. Tatum has to get to the rim, be aggressive, get some buckets. I mean, he plays the whole quarter. I think his rotations put Tatum into the whole third quarter. Again, if you're playing, if you're the best player, and you're playing the whole third quarter, and we've been bad in the third quarter, probably, you know, might be your fault. And, you know, again, it's not just one person. But it, those are things you got to think about, man, because, you know, Third quarters and blowing leads and stuff like that, those are habits that you can't let, you know, you really cannot let mess up your season. However, you know, this has been a great show. We hit on a lot. We talked about a lot. We did talk about a lot. Cover a lot. And it was a good one. And, again, um, let us know on Instagram. I'll post it on Instagram, uh, your, uh, your guys' thoughts on this. But, personally, I like this way more in yeah. person. Yeah. I think it's, it's way more fun. It's something that we're trying out and we want to – but here's the thing. We want to consistently get better, just like the players. 100%. And, you know, it turned out three years ago, you know, we were sitting in basements <laughs> and we were on laptops yeah. and stuff. And we want to make this 
our livelihood. So you know, we're gonna ninety try to followers. Do ninety followers. We're gonna try to we're gonna try to do everything we can to make the not only the production wise better, but just ourselves be better. And right. and and you know, we want to make this work. I think Rob and I, you know, we started this a couple a few years ago, and you know, obviously Seamus, Franco, Ian, and David have all helped us as well. But you know, this is a project that Rob and I started and we believe in and we want to really take it to the next level and so. get us to 10k get us to 10k on instagram uh push it out man i mean again you guys are awesome Celtics fans and the Celtics community is so great i love each and every one of you guys let's push for 10k because again this goes as far as we take this thing to go this celtics talk weekly movement is coming man and again guys thank you so much we hit on a lot today right from the all-star snubs from the boston celtics the milwaukee bucks who's who's the top dogs in the east in terms of who threatens the boston celtics we hit on all of it and we really do hope that you guys enjoyed this episode rob justin um until next week go celtics